So today we're going to start with the effect of impurities. Okay. Sea water is impure water. The water we drink every day, like mineral water, is impure water. Now, what is the effect of impurities as the minerals and those salts that are dissolved in water in on that solution? First, that if you take seawater in evaporating dish, boil the water away, you'll get a solid residue of the salt. Seawater freezes at a temperature well below the freezing point of water, zero degrees centigrade, or boils above the boiling point of pure water, 100 degrees centigrade. So what's going to happen is that impurity can reduce the sharpness of melting of boiling point, and impurity is going to change or make the substance melt or boil over a range of temperatures, not at a particular point. So this is something that we need to define by two methods. So first, what we're going to define is this. This whole thing is very important. And I've seen every alternate paper using this piece of information and manipulating it into a well-stated MCQ or a beauty question. The presence of an impurity does what? It lowers the melting point. For example, the melting point of ice made out of pure water is exactly zero degrees centigrade, let's say. Then for mineral water, ice made out of mineral water or ice made out of sea water or any of impurity present in the system would do what? Would decrease the melting point from zero degrees centigrade. It won't boil, uh, it won't melt at zero degrees centigrade anymore. It might does that at 0 0.1, minus 0 0.1, or minus 0 0.2, maybe minus one, maybe minus two. You can't say for sure how it's going to act, but if it's one of these things, that's definitely less than zero point, zero degree centigrade. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, so what we do is that we write it like this, or we write it in a sentence that lowers the melting point. What is, it does at the same time is that it it raises the boiling point. So what's going to happen if we're talking about melting point like this, and if we talk about boiling point like this, the boiling point would be greater than 100 degrees centigrade. It can be 100.1 degrees centigrade. It can be 101 degrees centigrade. It can be something in between or something even higher. So it raises the boiling point. So we can write it in different methods since we do not exactly know what's going to happen. So instead of writing all of this, we use the, this kind of phrase. We use this. Make sense? Or we write it in the words. Okay. It also says one more thing. It makes the substance melt or boil over a range of temperatures, not at a particular point. This can be explained when we go with the heating and cooling curves. Heating and cooling curves is something that needs to be explained in the form of curve. When I use the word curve, I'm actually talking about graph, all right? So what do we need to do? First, we need to follow an experiment to get a standard set of values that we can plot over a graph. What do we do? We take a powdered solid, we put it in a narrow melting point tube so it can be heated easily. If we're gonna heat it up to 100 degrees centigrade, we may use a water bath. If we want to heat it a more than 100 degrees centigrade, we need an oil bath. I hope I told you that this is written right over here in this portion in the figure captions. A water bath can be used for melting points below 100 degrees centigrade. And for above 100 degrees centigrade, we need oil baths. Right? Yes. Okay. So what do we do? We put up an apparatus like this. We put in a solid. We go for heating it, we melt it into a liquid, we further heat it up, we boil it into a gaseous or vapor form, and we keep noting the temperature after regular intervals, All right? What we do is that we note a lot of points and we plot those points in the form of a graph. Let's say this, that the specific solid that we used was naphthalene. Let's say, and you notice from this graph that the point of nephilim, and let me change, use a different color to explain it. You'd notice that the point of nephilim does not change from 80 degrees centigrade. This is the value. This is the degree centigrade graph. You'd see then at zero minutes, we started heating it up. 
and we took it to around 80 degrees centigrade at about uh, some like three minutes and all the way to six minutes for the whole of nephilim took its melting point and was converted from solid to liquid at this specific temperature right now nephilim is actually a pure substance as the name suggests Wax, however, is a mixture. A mixture can be regarded as an impure substance. All right? Because it is made up of more than one material. Now, what happens, you'd notice that the wax melts, but you cannot find a sharp temperature for it. It melts over a range of temperatures. Since it is made up of many materials, some of them melt over here, some of them melt over here, some of them melt over here, some of them melt a little above 70. So we have a range of temperatures at which they melt. We don't even get a straight line over here like that thing does. So the heating curve is a very good idea to give, tell us about the pure substances and a mixture of substances. Now, well, how do we say? Pure substances have sharp melting or boiling points. Sharp means there would be a straight line on graph uh, parallel to x-axis like this one, and we'll be able to correlate this line to a specific melting point. And we'll have no sharp melting points in case of mixtures or impure substances. So they will melt over a range of temperatures or they'll boil over a range of temperatures. You'd also notice one important, very important thing about this heating curve. When a solid is melted or when a liquid is boiled, the temperature stays constant in a straight line until the whole process is complete for the whole substance. The same is true in reverse when a gas is condensed or liquid is frozen. You notice that from three minutes, all the way to six minutes. For this specific time, the whole of nephilim melted from solid state to liquid state without an increase in temperature, and the temperature stood constant at the value of 80 degrees centigrade till all of it was converted into liquid. Once all of it was converted into liquid, the temperature started rising again. And the same thing would happen at boiling point, and you get a sharp boiling point as well. Although that's not the boiling point, I'm just zooming one. Make sense? Gee, sir. Good, good. Now, continuing, let's talk about the actual uh, heating or cooling curve. Now, your book uh, actually jumps to a cooling curve, but before we can jump to a cooling curve, I'd really like to explain a heating curve more with a few questions. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna close this book, I'm gonna open up a whiteboard, and we're gonna draw one and discuss some questions out of it, all right? So let's share a whiteboard. Okay, I hope you can see the whiteboard too, right? Yes, sir. Good. So what I'm going to do is that I am going to draw, hopefully I can draw a good one. Because my point still are just so so they're not as good as they should be. Okay. So let's say this is the kind of curve, the curve that we got from let's say this these are some points that we have on x-axis. And though I'm trying to 
evenly spaced them. As I said earlier, I'm really not good at it. So let's call it an x-axis. Can't even evenly space them properly. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I know this is pathetic. <laughs> so don't laugh at me. Okay. So I'm going to put some numbers or letters in there and we're going to define these as different symbols. Okay, so it would be a really good activity to discuss all of this. Okay, let me change color so that I can actually put some stuff in there. Let's name this as A, name this as B, name this as C, as D, as E. Let's extrapolate this one and call this one as F. Let's extrapolate this and call this one as G. Let's extrapolate these two and call these as H. And then this one. I. Okay. Let's call this 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Let's call these as minutes. Let's say that this is time and time is taken in minutes and it is increasing from left to right. Let's say this one is temperature. Temperature is being taken in degree centigrade. This is 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, this is supposed to be 100, 110, 120, 130, 140 degrees centigrade. And let's say the temperature is increasing from bottom to top. Okay. So, questions. Okay, question number one. States of matter at A, B, C, D, and E. Let's say this is heating curve for substance X. Okay, let's start working. What do you think the state of matter would be at point A? Since I've already shared the experiment, so you know where we're going to start with, right? G, it is solid. Right, perfect. A is solid. What is C? Liquid. Good guess. Liquid. Then what is E? Yes. Good. So then what is B? What would be the state of matter at B? Now this is a little bit tricky. So think about it before you answer, since you're going to also reason it. It will... Mm. Come on, let's not delay it. What do you have in mind? Do you need your hint? Yes, it will turn from uh, it will be it will turn from 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 solid to liquid. 
No, actually, I'm just talking about the state of matter. So it can't be from and to. It has to be an answer. Okay. It can either be solid or liquid or gas or a mixture of any two or three of these. Solid. So what's the point at A then? If it's solid at A and solid at B, why have I marked it as two separate points and not just one? Okay, let me give you a hint. It's actually not a pure state of matter. It's a mixture. So what do you think this mixture would contain? Solid plus? Solid plus liquid. Good idea. Now that's better. Now try to understand at the point B, since solid is being converted into liquid, so what happens is that solid plus liquid coexist. Make sense? Yes, sir. It would make a little more sense uh, after we're done with uh, a couple of parts. So what about D? Again, D would be a mixture. So I guess. So it will be um, liquid and gas? Coexist. Liquid plus gas, very good. Both the states of matter would coexist at this temperature. Okay, so B, in case of B, the solid plus the liquid coexist, just like when we present our cold drink bottle to a guest, we add in some ice cube. So ice is actually the solid and the soft drink is the liquid solution and both of them coexist at the same temperature for some time. If the temperature is hot, the ice after some time will melt into the liquid and uh, if the temperature is too cold and if you have put the whole thing in a freezer, maybe the liquid also starts freezing and the whole thing is frozen into a solid. That really depends. Now, since we are heating it up and it's a heating curve, so the, the solid is supposed to melt into a liquid. So at this specific point, when the state is changing, both the solids and liquid would coexist. Make sense? Yes, sir. And when we're converting a liquid into a gas, both the liquid and gas would coexist at that point. That is D. Which brings me to my second question. Name of process at B and P. So what's happening at B? Melting. Perfect. And what's occurring at D? Evaporation. No. Okay. Boiling. Boiling, since it's occurring at the at a specific temperature, so it's not evaporation; it's boiling. I hope that makes perfect sense. Does it? G sir. Good. So at B, melting is occurring, and at D, boiling is occurring. Which brings me to my next question. What is F? The temperature point at which melting occurs is known as Okay, at B, the melting, the process of melting is occurring. Melting occurs at a specific temperature. That temperature is known as, we have studied this definition, think about it. Um, the temperature at which melting occurs is known as? 37 degrees. No, that's the value. You don't need to find out the value yet. Not asking what is the value for, I'm asking the name for it. So what's 37 degrees? What would you call it? For Body substance no. <laughs> Melting point, think about it. The temperature point at which melting occurs is known as 
melting point. Makes sense? Jeez. You were going in a different direction. Though you were right finding out the temperature, it's around 37 at this point. Well done. But the name of this temperature point at which melting occurs is known as a melting point, which leads us to my next part of the question. What is G then? The temperature point at which boiling occurs is known as? Again, but, melting, um, boiling point. Right. If it's melting, then melting point is boiling, then boiling point will be boiling point. Pretty easy, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Now, for number four, what's the time taken for H? melting aap iska mujhe answer batayenge in minutes of course and i which was boiling so what do you think the time has taken for melting was since you were just working perfectly with values so i think you can work with values over there yes. so how much time did melting took just go with the approximate values. Just come up with the values. Since not every value is perfectly written and the numbers are perfectly spaced. So what did you do? You figure subtract here? The 60 with 25. 60 with 25. Yes. And your answer is? 35. 35. Good enough. And what about the I part? You can okay. subtract here. 135 uh -huh. minus 91 or 2. If this is 92, then this is 135. 92, okay. Let's take it as 92. Good work. 135, 6, 7, 8. Let's turn it into 138. Okay? Since it's close at 140. So 138 negative 92 minus 92 is... Oh, 46. Good, 46. So which one took more time, boiling or melting? Boiling. Right. So you'd understand that liquid into gaseous conversion takes sometimes more time and more a higher temperature because we need to move them further away. But in case of solid to liquid conversion, in case of melting, that occurs at a lower temperature and so much takes less time since we are moving them a little bit away from one another and not too far away. Make sense? Yes, sir. Do you know how to write the equations? Yes. You know that? Okay. Would you like which to write equation? one? You don't even know which equation I'm talking about. He said yes, by the way. Okay. Do you know how to write the equation for melting or boiling? No. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to write the equations for you for melting and boiling so that you would know. And I'm going to change the color for this one so that it's easier to get. Okay. So for melting, the equation would be something like this. X, since the name of the substance is X over here, so X from solid state converts into, in a reversible reaction, into X into a liquid state. And in case of boiling, it would be X from a liquid state would, oops, won't budge. I'm going to write it a little over here. I hope you can see it, right? Yes, sir. Good, good. So X uh, goes from liquid to gaseous thing. That's how we write the equations with the state symbols. I hope you are familiar with the state symbols. Small s stands for solid, L stands for liquid, G stands for gas, and AQ stands for aqueous solution. Since we're talking about conversions of solid into liquid and liquid into gas, so we don't need the aqueous state symbol. We only need these three. S, L, and G. Make sense? 
Yes, sir. So if a heating curve is there in the form of a proper graph, can you answer the questions? Answer the questions like these? Yes, sir. Okay. Does it show you that a pure substance gives you a sharp melting and a boiling point? For example, in this case, the melting point value you told me was F is equal to what? F, oh uh, yeah, 37. 37 what? With the units? Degree Celsius. Right. And what about G? What is the value of G? 70 degrees Celsius. Perfect. So you know about both, right? Yes, sir. Now you know how to calculate the temperature values, different temperature values, such as melting a boiling point, or you know how to calculate the time taken. So you know the states coexist at specific points, and uh, you also know how to write their equations, right? So that's all you need to know about the heating curve. Good enough? Yes, sir. Any questions before I get back to the book? No, sir, it's clear. Good, great. So I'm gonna close the whiteboard and we're gonna get back to the book. All right, so in the book, uh, next up is a cooling curve. And you'd notice cooling curve is the exact opposite of the heating curve. You started off with a gas, you started cooling it down, you convert it into a liquid. This process is known as or named as liquefaction since that occurs at a specific temperature. You may call it condensing, but let me tell you condensing is the conversion at any temperature, not at a specific one. All right? Make yes, sense? Sir. Okay. Next up, if you keep on cooling it, and there comes a point when the liquid is frozen into a solid. So this kind of conversion is known as freezing. Freezing occurs at a specific point known as freezing point. And then the liquid is converted into solid. So now you know the liquefaction point for this specific gas is 78 degrees centigrade. And the freezing point for this specific gas is around minus 15 degrees centigrade. G, sir. All right. So. Now you know the heating curves and the cooling curves. You also know the difference about pure substances and impure substances since you saw a difference over here, right? You know that the values are sharp for pure substances and they're not sharp for impure substances. You also understand that the temperature stays constant during a phase change until the process for the whole substance is complete. That's why you have straight lines in the graph that are to x axis, right? Yes, sir. So this actually finishes the topic of uh, heating and cooling curves for us. Let's move on. Types of mixtures. First of all, you already know that mixture is a mix of at least two parts and mixtures are impure substances. So one of the ways we use the mixtures are solutions. Now, I hope you're familiar with the solutions. When I use the term solution, Yes, sir. Just a second, let me go to the next page. I hope you understand we use the terms as solute and solvent. The substance that is being dissolved is solute, and the liquid which usually in which the substance is dissolved is known as a solvent, right? Yes, sir. You also understand that we sometimes use a suspension. A suspension is where the particles simply suspend in the system. Although this yes. is a diagram for dissolving, but suspension suspension is something that we do use in our daily life. For example, most of the medical syrups, like cuff syrups that we commonly use, are actually suspensions. They're not exactly solutions in which it completely dissolves, and they're not exactly insoluble ones in which the solid settles at the bottom. They're suspensions since the uh, one of the solids suspend in the liquid. And if you give it some time, they might settle down at the bottom again. That's why sir, you might have noticed a direction written on most of our uh, solutions, suspension solutions like that, 
shake well before use. It's even written on our juice packs, juice boxes. Shake well before use. So you shake a little the juice box, you uh, right before opening it up, and then you start consuming it. Make sense? Yes, sir. Can you please tell the definition for suspension? Yeah, that's even present in the glossary of the book. The suspension is a simple mixture where the particles of the solid suspend in the liquid instead of dissolving in it. Okay. Actually, we stick to this much. I'm actually trying to draw a boundary line over here. I don't want to waste too much time on suspension since in past 10 years papers, you, you might rarely see a question about suspension. You should only be familiar with it. You're not going to get a question about it. That's why I'm trying to draw a boundary line and not go into any further detail. Just the definition and an example is good enough. All right, let's move on. Yes. Okay, so solutions. Now here he is going to go with different types of solutions, but not all the types are clearly written. So what I'm gonna do is that we are going to go with different types of solutions. So I'm gonna again move from the book over to our whiteboard and there we're going to go with different types of solutions and I'm, I'm going to take some examples to make sure that you understand those so let's get back to our whiteboard now in case of whiteboards uh, you should be familiar with something in case of a zoom whiteboard what happens is that on the left hand side you get a whole bar of options do you Sometimes you get it at the bottom, sometimes you get it on your extreme left, like using a pencil and a razor, stuff like that. No, sir. Are you getting it? Uh, are you getting it at the left hand side or at the bottom? I cannot see it anywhere. Move your mouse a little so that you can see them. No, sir, I cannot see it. Not even now? Okay, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna close the whiteboard and open it again. Just a second. If you're facing a glitch, it should be over there. I've also allowed for you to be able to collaborate with me. Now you can also collaborate with me here. So now can you see it? What do you see? The first page heating up for substance X? Yes. And you can't see any of the options at the bottom or on your extreme left? No, sir. An option like, uh, just a second, let me draw it for you. You would notice this kind of stuff at the bottom and there would be page one. If you click it, it, it would give you the number of pages. I want you to then go ahead, click this button and go to page number two. I see I cannot get that option. Okay, just a second. So now I'm going to go with types of solutions, all right? Since that topic is not given in detail on a single page of the book and is actually scattered throughout different pages of the book. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to uh, go with one page for to discuss all types of solutions. First uh, things first, on the basis of solubility, we have two types, number one, soluble solution and i hope you're familiar with this one right and yes the second type in soluble solution can you define soluble solution for me just my cheese dissolve for a second right pretty easy where solid can dissolve in liquid solvent right and insoluble yes. how about that 
the solution in which it's hard to dissolve. Right. So a solid solute cannot dissolve in a liquid solvent. Makes yes, sense, sir. right? So yes, sir. this is the first type. Let's start off with the second type on the basis of miscibility. Now you you might be hearing this word for the first time, and there are again two types miscible solution, right? And immiscible solution. Okay, I'm not writing the whole thing, so it's, that's going to take a lot of time. Let's get to the definition. Now, this one has a little bit of difference than the previous one. You'd notice that liquid solute can dissolve in liquid solvent. Can you notice the difference between the previous one and this one? Yes, sir. Okay, so as soon as you notice that this difference, you'd know that if the solute is liquid, we use the words miscible and immiscible. If the solute is solid, we use the words soluble and insoluble. Yes, sir. So that's the only difference we have. Previously, you might be using uh, words soluble whether the solute was liquid or solid, those were easier classes, we understand. But now since you know how to bifurcate between both, you should be using the appropriate term. If your solute and solvent are both liquids, use the term miscible or immiscible. If your solute and solvents are respectively solid and a liquid, then you should be using the term soluble and insoluble. Make sense? Okay, sir. Yes. Good. I think these are pretty easy definitions. And along with these definitions, you can obviously come up with um, the examples. For example, you can always tell me an example for soluble solution, can you? Yes, sir, just a second. I'm noting the definition down. I'm gonna send you the entire picture. Don't worry, whatever I'm drawing on the whiteboard, you'll get it in the form of either a picture or a PDF. You don't okay. need to note down the stuff uh, right away. You can do it after the class. Uh, during the class, you can just sit and understand the whole thing. Then if I have some questions, you can go ahead and answer those questions for me. Okay. Gee, sir. So uh, I was saying that, uh, can you get me uh, an example for soluble solution? Um, salt and water. Salt and water, perfect. Insoluble solution. Come on, think of a solid that does not dissolve in a liquid. You may think of water as a liquid since those are the easiest examples to think of in a paper. Oil and water. What? I oil wasn't able to hear. Is oil solid? Oh, Is no, it oil a liquid? Sorry. Yes, sorry. So if you need to bifurcate your example, which type of solution is it? Which type of solution is oil and water? Oil is a liquid. So which type of example should it go to? It's definitely not an example of insoluble solution. It is immiscible solution. Perfect, perfect. So you already have an example for immiscible solution. Now let's talk about the example you were supposed to give me in the first place, insoluble solution. Think about uh, it. Coming up with something? No. What about sand? Think 
thinking about it. What about sand? The sand is open water. No. Sand and water for insoluble solution. Right, good. What about miscible solution? Um, water and a juice? No. Um, water and a juice. It's a perfect example. Actually, juice is already a mixture itself, but since both are liquids, you can mix them up. Just like we are in a habit of, uh, well, Pakistani moms are in a habit of going with soda milk. They add soda to milk. Have you ever tried it? No. You haven't tr ever tried adding Sprite or 7-Up to milk and then drinking it? Mm. Don't tell me that. You don't know about that. I do know about it. I've never tried it. Okay, try it once. You might like it. Okay, so I guess we are now good with the examples of soluble, insoluble, miscible, and immiscible solution. Well, when we talk about Pakistani milk bands, they are pretty much in a habit of adding uh, water to milk since both of them are soluble, and that's how they increase the milk and then sell it at a good rate. Since they are pretty dishonest, I shouldn't be saying that on a YouTube channel, <laughs> but um, yeah. dishonest people do that. They try to mix up stuff, and when things are miscible like these, when two liquids are miscible like these, they may try to take the disadvantage out of it. Okay, since you're sitting in a country where this does not happen, you might not know about it. Or do you? No, I know about it. Very okay, good, good. Okay. Um, let's get to concentration. Now there are two subtypes when we talk about types of solution in concentration, dilute and concentrated solution. Sorry, I wrote the word concentration solution. I just now noticed it, that instead of writing concentrated solution, I wrote concentration solution. So concentrated solution. Now, this is actually a relative term. When I use the word relative term, it means we're comparing two solutions. Now, let me give you two examples. Let's say we have two same size beakers, even though my drawing skills are not good, let's take same size beakers, let's say, in both the beakers, I added 100 grams water each. Now this contains 100 grams water. So does this one, this one so also contains 100 grams water, right? And in one of these, I added five grams of table salt that we eat every day. And in the other one, I added 10 grams of table salt that we eat every day. So which one do you think is dilute solution and which one do you think is a concentrated solution? The one with uh, five grams of salt is the dilute one because it has more water. And the other one is the concentrated solution because it has more salt. Uh, I don't understand about your explanation for water. I do understand the concentrated one is concentrated because it has more salt. But how come the one with five grams salt has more water since both of them has 100 grams of water? Oh, I thought the second one had 10 grams of water. No, 5 grams salt, 10 grams salt, then 100 grams water in each of them. Um, so one has more salt and one has less salt, right? Let's take another mm -hmm. example. I take the same size speakers again. I add 5 grams salt to the first speaker. I add 5 grams salt to the second speaker the amount of salt is same then i added 80 grams of water in the first beaker and then i added 100 grams of water to the second beaker how about now which one is dilute and which one is concentrated your answers to the previous one were correct though your explanation wasn't exactly correct but your answers were now what about the second situation the first one is concentrated, no. Um, All right. 
I think you were going in the right direction. So don't confuse yourself. The second one is dilute because it has more water. And right. The second the, one is dilute because it has more water. The first one's concentrated because it has it less, has less water. water. Right, right. Yeah. Perfect. Which brings me to my explanation. And I'm going to write it with a different color so it doesn't bother you. We call a solution dilute. All right. If it has either less solute or in a case it has more solvent. In either of the cases, you know that we call this one dilute because it has more solvent because of this. And we call this one dilute since it had it had less solute. So both the cases are applicable. Do you understand my point now? Yes, sir. Good. And in the concentrated, we have the same kind of cases. The first one is it's concentrated if it has more solute. All right. We may also call it concentrated if it has less solvent. Make sense? So this one's concentrated due to the more amount of salt and this one's concentrated due to the less amount of water. Right? G. So I'm going to export it as a picture. Now I'm going to erase the right hand side and I'm going to come up with the last type on the right hand side. Then I'll export another picture and instead the whole document for today. And then you can make your notes from that document. Okay. So moving on okay. to the last slide. Sorry. Yes, sir. Something? No, sir. Okay. So getting back to the last time and then we're going to wind up the class. I know I'm taking a little bit of more time than we are supposed to. So the last one is based upon saturation. Now this one is a little bit, a little bit complicated than the previous one. So uh, we also have more types than we usually do. This one is actually bifurcated into three types, saturated solution, unsaturated solution, And number three is super saturated solution. Okay. And I'm going to come up with different examples to make sure that you understand it. Or do you know it about it already? I only know about saturated solution and unsaturated solution. We have not Can you define saturated it? solution for me to begin with? Um, which has, um, I think, which has more solvent. Okay, a uh, solution that has maximum amount of solute at a particular temperature. Let's say a glass of water can only dissolve three tablespoons of sugar at room temperature. Let's say we have a glass of water. The average glasses of water at home are 250 cubic centimeter or 250 ml, one fourth of a liter, all right? So let's say one glass of water can only add up uh, one entire tablespoon filled with sugar. Uh, let's say uh, one glass of water can dissolve three tablespoons of sugar, sorry. All right, three tablespoons of sugar. If you add all three tablespoons, if you dissolve them, taking some time out, then if all of it is dissolved, you try to add more sugar, the sugar will simply sit at the bottom. No matter how much you stir, you won't be able to dissolve it. Then you say that the maximum amount of solute that you could have dissolved at that particular temperature, you've already dissolved it, it's a saturated solution. A saturated solution cannot dissolve any more solute at that temperature since the maximum has already been dissolved. Make sense? Okay, sir. Let's compare it with the other two types so that it makes more sense to you. 
So less than maximum amount of solute at a particular temperature. So what if in the second row you don't add three tablespoons of sugar, you only add one or you only add two. Now, since you can add more sugar and it would be able to dissolve that sugar in it, it's an unsaturated solution. Since you haven't gone to the maximum amount and you can still dissolve more at that particular temperature, it's an unsaturated solution. Means unsaturated solution has the capacity to dissolve more solute, unlike the saturated solution. Gee, sir. Right? And let's come to supersaturated solution. Now, what if you dissolve, want to dissolve more than three tablespoons of sugar in the same amount of water? Then you do what? It won't dissolve. It won't dissolve, but there is a trick to dissolve it. What would you do? Can you change any conditions? High temperature. Right, right. High temperature. How do you think we make a sugar syrup? Are you uh, familiar with the common Pakistani sweet jalebi? Yes. Now, jalebi is filled with a sugar syrup. How do we make a sugar syrup? We add a lot of sugar and a little amount of water in order to mix that sugar into water, since we have more sugar than what we can commonly dissolve at room temperature, what do we do? We start heating up the water. When the water is at a higher temperature, it is capable of dissolving more sugar. For example, you can easily do this experiment at home. Take a glass of water, fill it up with water, add one tablespoon of sugar, you will be able to dissolve it with a little bit of stirring. Add another tablespoon, you would be able to dissolve it with more stirring. At the third tablespoon, it would take some time, but after some time, you'd be able to dissolve it. At the fourth tablespoon, it would still sit at the bottom, no matter you dissolve it for the next 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you keep on stirring, you won't be able to dissolve it. So now you can say it is a saturated solution. At one tablespoon, it was unsaturated. At two tablespoons, it was unsaturated. At three tablespoons dissolved, it became a saturated solution. At four tablespoons, it still is a saturated solution, but you are unable to dissolve it. Now you start heating that water up. So shift that water along with the sugar into a pan, start heating that pan up. Now, when you start heating it up, you'd see you'll be able to dissolve the four tablespoons. At a fifth one, you'll see you'll be able to dissolve that too. At a sixth one, you'll see you'll be able to dissolve that too. That's how we come up with the sugar syrup. We heat up the water and at a high temperature, the water is capable of dissolving more amount of sugar than what it really can at that particular temperature. At the particular temperature actually was the room temperature at which you were doing the experiment. So that is a supersaturated solution. Remember for a supersaturated solution, you can dissolve more amount than the saturated solution, but you do that at a higher temperature. Make sense? Okay. Good, great. So now you're clear with different examples. Don't go around the kitchen, wasting some sugar, some water, burning yourself up in order to do this experiment. And then your parents start asking me questions. Why are you giving our uh, experiments like these? I don't know how good or how bad you are in the kitchen. So only do the experiments which do not harm you. All right? Yes. Sir. Remember, safety comes first. Yes. Reba probably is more important to her parents uh, parents than a sugar solution. Is she? Yes, I think. <laughs> I think. Oh, come on. You're not sure? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's wind it up over here. I guess we're done with it. Do you have any questions? No, sir. It's clear. Good. Great. Let's get back to the book. And now, do you understand or see the types of solution miscible and all of that? Some of the types are given over here. I'm gonna go forward a couple of pages. And if you move forward a couple of pages, you notice that some of the types of solutions 
are also discussed in page number 33, where the definition of solute, solvent, solution, and then uh, soluble, insoluble, concentrated, dilute, saturated, all of these are also given over there. So actually these types were scattered. What I did was to cover them all up in a single page. Since our next topic is separation or and purifying of substances, we're done with 2.1 completely. We're gonna start with 2.2 tomorrow or in our next sitting. And for these, this very topic, it would be very helpful if you're familiar with the words like soluble, insoluble, dilute, concentrated, miscible, immiscible, saturated, Things I'm going to use those terms in 2.2, all right? Any yes, questions sir. or should we wind up the class? No, sir, it's clear.